Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity, the awesome opportunity of opening your holy word, and particularly the book of Genesis. We ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we study about the serpent, the woman, and the seed. We thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to be with us, and we ask it in the precious name of your beloved Son, Jesus. Amen. We'd like to begin our study at the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. This is one of the better known texts of Holy Scripture. And I don't even have to look it up because I have it memorized. I'm sure you do also. It says there, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Three things I want us to notice in this verse. First of all, the expression, in the beginning. Secondly, God, and in the third place, created the heavens and the earth. Now let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and we'll read verses 1 and 3. And I'm trying to make a point by comparing these two passages of Scripture, or these texts of Scripture. It says there in John chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then let's go to verse 3. It says there, All things were made through Him, that is, through the Word. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. Very clearly, these two Texts of Scripture are closely linked because in both of them you have the expression in the beginning. In both of them you have the idea of God. In fact, the word God is used. And in both you have creation. In Genesis it says that, the, that God created the heavens and the earth. In John chapter 1 it says that the word created all things, and without him, nothing was made that was made. So we have the same three ideas in Genesis and in John. The point that I'm trying to make is that the creator of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 was none other than Jesus Christ. Because in John chapter 1, we find that the word is Jesus. Because we're told in verse 14 that the word was made flesh. And so the creator of the book of Genesis is Jesus Christ. And obviously in Genesis it says God and Jesus is God. Now even though Jesus was the creator of this world, he did not directly rule the world. He placed on this earth a king to rule for him. I want you to notice this in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Actually, God placed here a king and a queen, if you please. It says in verse 28, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. I'm going to stop there for a moment. Have dominion. That word means rule reign, govern. Now every king has to have a territory over which to rule. Now what was the territory? Let's go back to verse 28. It says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we have two principal ideas in this verse. Number one, Adam was placed as king on this planet. And of course, Eve was by his side as queen. And their territory of dominion, or their territory of rule, was planet Earth. However, if we go to Genesis chapter 2, and verses 16 and 17, we're going to discover that God laid down a condition for them to continue their rule 
and for them to continue enjoying the earth as the territory of their domain. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17. God put a test in the garden. You see, Adam and Eve did not ask God to create them. They were created and now they had to choose to be loyal to God. It wasn't enough just to create them and automatically they would serve God. God wanted to give them a choice and He placed the tree in the garden to give them a choice so that they could serve Him not because He merely created them but because he could cho they could choose to do so. Now Genesis chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17 say this, And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So God placed this condition in the garden of Eden. He said, Adam and Eve, I created you. If you want to continue reigning over the earth, if you want to continue enjoying the territory of your domain, you must abstain from eating from this tree. You must make the choice. I'm not going to force you. I created you, yes, to serve me, but I'm giving you a choice, and the tree will give you that opportunity to choose. Now let's just uh, pause for a moment before we continue our study of Genesis chapter 2. And I want you to notice the condition that Adam and Eve were in when they were created. Notice Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25. Just a short parenthesis in our study to notice how Adam and Eve were garbed originally when they were created. It says there in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25, And they were both naked the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. We get the impression from Genesis 2 verse 25 that Adam and Eve were totally naked and they weren't ashamed. However, we need to understand that they were naked with respect to human garments. They had no man-made garments, so to speak, but they were robed. They were robed with a garment of light. And you say, how do we know that? Well, we have several avenues in Scripture which indicate this. By the way, do you know that God's garments, which are spoken of as being white in Scripture, are actually garments of light? I want you to notice Psalm 104 and verses 1 and 2. Psalm 104 and verses 1 and 2. Here the garments of God are described. And it says here, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. And now notice verse 2. Who cover yourself with light as with a garment. Who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. Notice here that God covers himself with what? With light as a garment. In other words, the garments of God are garments of light. They're not made out of satin. They're not made out of any other type of material. They are light. And Adam and Eve, even though they were naked with respect to human garments, they were covered with the glorious light of God. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1 where it speaks about the true church. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. It speaks here about a woman, and I want you to notice how this woman is garbed. She's garbed in white garments, but I want you to notice what the white garments are. It says, now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with what? Clothed with the sun. We'll stop there. We'll only read till there. The woman was garbed with the sun. She had radiant garments. They were not artificially made garments. They were garments of light. Notice also Psalm 8, Psalm 8, and we'll see once again that Adam, when he was created, because it's talking specifically about Adam in uh, Psalm 8, he was robed in garments of light. Notice Psalm 8, and we want to begin reading at verse 3. 
Psalm 8 and verse 3. Here David says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. And now notice this. And you have crowned him. Who wears crowns? Kings. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Some versions say with glory and splendor. In other words, Adam, when he was created, was covered with the glory and the splendor of God. And he was crowned to be king over creation. And so you can imagine Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, in their innocence, naked but covered with the garments of light that God provided for them. But then Adam and Eve decided to disobey God. They decided to exercise their freedom of choice to eat from the tree rather than obeying God. And I want you to notice what the first result of their sin was. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. The first consequence of their sin. We're told there in Genesis 3 and verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked. Now let's stop there for a moment. They knew that they were naked. What happened with the glorious robe of light? The glorious robe of light disappeared. It left them. That's why in the book of Romans it says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because when they sinned, the robe of light left. And now suddenly they see themselves naked. And I want you to notice what solution they implement to the problem of their nakedness. It continues saying, once again, chapter 3 and verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves coverings. In other words, they covered their own nakedness by making garments of fig leaves. But do you know what's interesting? Even though they had covered their nakedness, with artificial garments, they still felt naked. Which clearly indicates that the original garments they had were not artificial garments, they were garments of light. I want you to notice in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. Here we're told in Genesis 3 and verse 10 that even after they covered themselves with the fig leaves, they still feel naked. Obviously, their nakedness is not nakedness of body, it's nakedness of soul. They're guilty before God. They've lost their innocence because garments represent innocence, represent righteousness, represent holiness. They were sinful now. They no longer had innocence and holiness and righteousness. Therefore, the garments of life, light, left them. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10. God comes looking for Adam. So he said... That is, Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, wait a minute. At this point, Adam wasn't naked. In verse 7, he had covered himself with fig leaves. And yet, even though he was covered with artificial garments, he still felt what? He still felt nakedness. Why? Because he no longer had the glorious robe of light. He knew that his garments were artificial. They were made by himself. And garments made by himself and by Eve could not begin to cover the nakedness of their soul. The nakedness of sin. So God now comes down to the garden. He's searching for Adam. And I want you to notice Genesis chapter 3 and let's start reading at verse 8. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Verse 13, And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Now there's some very important things that I want us to notice in this passage that I just read. You know, psychologists and psychiatrists today, I have nothing against psychologists and psychiatrists, but many times what they do is they treat the symptoms, but they do not treat the disease. I don't know whether you notice in this passage that for the first time in human history, you have guilt. For the first time in human history, you have Adam and Eve with a very low self-image. That's why they're, they're introverted. They're hiding from God. For the first time in human history, you have fear. For the first time in human history, you have blame. Adam is saying, this woman that you gave to be with me, if it hadn't been for her, I wouldn't have eaten. And the woman says, if you had made that serpent, the serpent would not have tempted me, and I would not have eaten. The blame game begins with sin. A low self-image begins with sin. Guilt begins with sin. Strife begins with sin. Fear begins with sin. And if you are going to resolve these psychological problems, the only way that you can resolve them is by solving the problem that caused these things in the first place. The problem of sin. And any psychiatrist or psychologist that does not deal with the central core issue of sin can never actually bring healing to people. And so Adam and Eve are there in the garden hiding from God. God searching for them. They're naked. They're covered with artificial garments, but they're naked. They're hiding from God. They're filled with fear because God has said that if they would eat from the tree, they would surely die. Now when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they lost what God gave them originally. First of all, they lost their dominion. They lost their role as rulers of the planet. Primarily Adam who was the head of the household. I want you to notice in Luke chapter 4 and verses 5 through 7. Who took over dominion? And who took over the earth? Because Adam and Eve also lost the earth as their territory. And they lost their position as rulers. I want you to notice Luke chapter 4. And we'll read verses 5 through 7. Jesus is here on the Mount of Temptation. And notice what the devil says to him. Then the devil taking him upon a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. What did the devil show him? All of the what? All of the kingdoms of the world. To whom did those kingdoms originally belong? To Adam. Verse 6, And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Notice that the devil said, The kingdoms of the world have been delivered to me, and to whomever I wish, I give them. Now the question is, who gave these kingdoms to the devil? It was Adam and Eve. Primarily Adam. Because Adam was the father and the representative of the human race. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, Adam gave up his position as king. Adam gave up the territory of the world and the devil took it over. This is the reason why Jesus called the devil the prince of this world. In fact, in the New King James Version, which is the one we're using in this seminar, it says the ruler of this world. 
We have an interesting story in the book of Job where God calls a heavenly council and the representatives of the different realms of the universe come to present themselves before the Lord. And among the sons of God who come from different places in the universe to present themselves before God, it says that Satan comes to that meeting. And God asked him, where did you come from? God knew, of course. And the devil says, I have come from roaming around the earth. What he's saying is, I have come from patrolling my territory, from reigning over my territory. In other words, he went to that meeting representing planet earth. Actually, Adam should have been the one representing planet earth in that meeting. But at this point, the devil had stolen dominion from Adam. And so you can imagine Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They're shaking. God has said that the day that we eat of the tree, we are going to die. What's that? Death. There had never been any death. But they know that it's something terrible. God has told them that it's something horrendous. And so now they're about to give up hope. And God comes down to the garden. He's already talked to the man. Notice that he talks to the man first. Holds him accountable. Then he talks to the woman. And then he says, I have some business to deal with the serpent. And so he comes and he speaks to the serpent. And I want you to notice what he says to the serpent. We call this the first gospel promise of the Bible. And uh, you know, many, many ministers say that this is a promise that God made to Adam and Eve. That's true, but only indirectly. Because really, this was, these words were not spoken to Adam and Eve. They were spoken to the serpent. But Adam and Eve, according to the story, were there listening to what God was saying to the serpent. And so as they were listening to what God was saying to the serpent, it became a promise for them as they heard the challenge of God. Now notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the words that God, actually Jesus in this case, speaks to the serpent. And there's four elements in this verse that I want to underline. And I will put enmity. First key word, don't forget that word. I will put enmity between you, the second idea is the serpent, the you there is the serpent. I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, third idea, and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, fourth idea, seed. Four ideas, enmity, serpent, woman, and seed. And I want you to notice that this battle goes between the serpent and the woman and between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. But the real warfare is not primarily between the serpent and the woman and the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. The real warfare is in the last part of this verse. Notice the last part of the verse. It says, He, that is the seed of the woman, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now what is God saying? God is saying, as a result of sin, there's going to be enmity, and I'm going to put that enmity between the serpent and the woman, and between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. Notice, two ways that the warfare runs. Serpent, woman, seed, seed. But he's saying that's not the real primary warfare. Because he says the seed of the woman is going to do battle with the serpent. And he is going to bruise the serpent's head. And the serpent is going to bruise his heel. Do you know what the picture is here? The picture is that God is saying to Satan. And we're going to notice in a moment that this is Satan. The Bible makes it very clear that this serpent was really Satan. Maybe he used the serpent uh, as, a, as a medium to speak. Some people think that he converted himself into a serpent. That's immaterial. But the person behind this really was Satan. And the picture that we have here is that God is saying to the devil, listen, you took dominion. You took the earth from Adam and Eve and from all of their descendants. But I am declaring war on you. I am going to send a seed to planet earth. 
That seed is going to do battle with you. In the process of the battle, you are going to hurt his heel. But in the process of hurting his heel, he is going to crush your head. The idea, if you can catch the picture, is an individual who's raising his foot to have the foot fall upon the head of the serpent. Now what might happen if you lift your foot to crush the head of a serpent? What might happen before your foot falls on his head? He might just bite your what? He might bite your heel. But after biting your heel, the foot comes down and crushes his head. That is the image that we have here. God is saying, I'm going to send a seed to the world. He's going to be born of a woman. He's going to take the place of Adam. He's going to be the second Adam. And he's going to do battle with you on the same battleground as the first Adam did. In the process of the battle, you're going to hurt him. You're going to bite his heel. But it's going to be a very expensive bite. Because after you bite his heel, his foot is going to come down upon your head. And he is going to crush you. And he's going to return to Adam and Eve and all of their descendants that which they lost. Now if that isn't good news, I don't know what good news is. I can imagine now the glimmer of hope. Adam and Eve saying, there's hope. God is going to send someone to the rescue. He's going to send a man born of a woman who is going to do battle with his enemy and he's going to recover that which we lost. Now the question is, who is this serpent? It's not an animal. It represents something beyond the literal animal. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 explains the identity of the serpent. It says there, So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old, by the way, I like the way the King James says it, that ancient serpent. Why do you suppose that he's called the ancient serpent in Revelation? What is God telling us? Hint, hint, go back to Genesis. If you want to understand this final battle, go back to Genesis. Isn't that what he's saying? Now who is this great dragon, that ancient serpent? Well, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Do you notice here who the serpent really was? The serpent was Satan himself. Either he used the serpent as a medium to speak, or he disguised himself as a serpent. That's immaterial. But behind the original temptation was Satan. Now, who is the serpent's seed? Well, we need to go to John chapter 8 and verse 44. The serpent's seed, John chapter 8 and verse 44. By the way, the devil doesn't do anything in this earth directly, or usually he doesn't work directly. He works through whom? He works through human instruments. He works through human beings. And in this way, the devil accomplishes what he wants to do. He doesn't do it directly. He does it indirectly. Jesus is speaking here in John chapter 8 and verse 44. Uh, to uh, a group of Jews who claim to be the children of Abraham, but they want to kill Jesus at this point. So notice what Jesus says in John chapter 8 and verse 44. By the way, no political correctness in the comment of Jesus. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus says to these people who are sharing the spirit of Satan, wanting to kill Jesus, you are of your father the devil. By the way, when we speak about the seed of Satan, we're not talking about people who literally, genetically originate with the devil. We're talking about people who have a character similar to the character of Satan. We have several other passages in Scripture. I'll just mention them in passing. We have, for example, 1 John 3.12, where it speaks about how Cain killed his brother Abel. It says there, not 
as Cain, who was of the wicked one and killed his brother. Notice that Cain killed his brother, yes, but he was actually of the wicked one. He was the seed of Satan. Satan accomplished his purpose through a human instrument. By the way, in the parable of the wheat and the tares in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 38, Jesus refers to the tares as the sons of the wicked one. So once again, the, the seed of Satan are his followers. We're going to identify in a moment who is the seed of the woman. The serpent is Satan. Now let's go to identify who this seed born of a woman is and who the woman is. Go with me to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Let's notice who this seed is born of a woman. Galatians 3 and verse 16 says this, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Who is the seed? The seed is Jesus Christ. Now notice also Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, just across the page. It says there in Galatians 4 verse 4, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a what? Born of a woman, born under the law. So who is this seed of the woman? The seed of the woman is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Also go with me to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16. And while you're looking for that verse, I, I want to tell you that in the Bible, genealogies are really uh, lists of men who bring men into the world. In other words, most of the names, with a couple of exceptions in the Bible, in genealogies are names of men. You go, for example, to Genesis chapter 5. You find all of the, uh, the uh, pre-flood heroes of the Old Testament. And they're all men. You go to the genealogy of Genesis 11, uh, which is the genealogy from the days of uh, Shem, the son of Noah, all the way to the time of Abraham. Once again, they're all men. You go to the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Every one of them is a man except for, for three women, Two of them are mentioned very briefly, and I want you to notice how this list ends in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16. It says there, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom, that is from Mary, was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Do you notice something interesting in this verse? Jesus is actually born of a what? Of a woman, but he is not born from Joseph. That's very unusual. Because in all of the genealogies, a male begets a male, begets a male, begets a male. And so on. But here we have the exception. It says here that Jesus was born from Mary, his mother, but he was not born from Joseph. The reason why is because Jesus Christ was actually the Son of God, was his Father. God was his Father. And so Jesus came to the world differently. This was contemplated in Genesis 3.15 where it says that the seed, it doesn't say that the seed would be born from a man or the seed would be born from a man and a woman. It says that the seed would be born from whom? From a woman. And by the way, Mary is the culmination of a whole series of women in the Old Testament and men which ultimately from that genealogy comes Jesus Christ. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12 once again to identify this seed. Revelation chapter 12, and let's read verses 1 and 2. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, 
and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Notice that she's pregnant. She's going to give birth to a seed. Now who is that seed? Notice verse 5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his what? To God and to his throne. Who is the seed of the woman? The seed of the woman is Jesus. Galatians 3.16 says so. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 tells us so. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16 tells us so. Revelation chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2 and 5 tell us that Jesus was that promised seed who was going to come to the world to rescue that which Adam and Eve and all of their descendants lost. Not only Adam and Eve, because Scripture tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one. Scripture tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no one within the human race who can rescue that which has been lost because everyone on planet earth at one point or another has become a slave of Satan, has been conquered by the evil one. So the human race needed someone who, to come and do battle who would never sin, who would win the victory so that eventually Adam and Eve and all of their descendants could recover dominion and could recover the earth as their inheritance. Of course the key question is this. How was the seed going to gain the victory over Satan? In order to restore rulership. In order to restore the earth. Obviously the nakedness of man had to be covered again. But how could the nakedness of sin be covered as a result of the, of the iniquity of Adam and Eve. How could that happen? Let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. I want you to notice that God not only says that He's going to send a seed to recover that which was lost, but He's going to explain how He's going to do it. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Do you remember that Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they covered themselves with what? Fig leaves. Were they still naked after they covered themselves with fig leaves? Could they appear before God's judgment bar in their nakedness? No, they couldn't. Did they need coverings that would truly cover their nakedness in order to appear before God and receive that which had been lost? Yes. Now how was the seed going to be able to cover them? How was the seed going to cover the shame of their nakedness? Genesis 3 verse 21, one of my very favorite verses in the whole Bible. It says, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Who made the garments? God did. Who clothed them? God did. What did He clothe them with? With garments of skin. What do you need to do in order to get the skin of an animal? You have to kill the animal. You see, on the very day that Adam and Eve sinned, there was an animal sacrifice. Most likely two animals were sacrificed. One for Adam and one for Eve. In a world there where there had been no death. Now the hand of Adam has to be raised up. You can imagine the little lamb coming when Adam calls the lamb. And Adam takes that little lamb in his arms. He takes the knife and he slits the throat of the lamb. And suddenly the blood gushes out of his throat. And that little lamb is limp in his arms. And then he has to take another lamb and slit that lamb's throat. And the blood gushes out. And the other lamb is limp in his arms. What was God trying to teach Adam and Eve when he took those skins after the lamb died and covered 
the shame of their nakedness. He was teaching what the seed needed to do when he came. The seed would have to shed his blood in order to cover the nakedness into which Adam and Eve and all of their descendants had fallen into. Now let's go to Genesis 2 verse 17. And notice something very interesting. I'm going to underline this point. Genesis 2 and verse 17. By the way, sometimes I read texts wrong. I've been told that I need glasses. And that's true. After this this series, I'm probably going to have to start using glasses. But I think I can read this text well enough. Genesis 2 verse 17. It says, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, a thousand years later you will die. (laughs) 930 years later you will die. No. God says, the day that you eat of it, that day you will surely die. By the way, in the Hebrew it says, you will die by death. I don't know of any other way that you can die. But God is saying, you are going to be dead as a doornail. You are going to surely die. You can take it to the bank, is what God is saying. The very day that you eat, you will die. Then the question is, why did Adam die when he was 930 years old? Why did all the heroes in Genesis chapter 5 die in their 800s, in their 700s, in their 900s? Did God lie when He said, the day that you eat of the tree, you will surely die? God did not lie. That day, the sentence of death was executed. But it was executed on those lambs. Do you know what happened that day? The sacrifice of those lambs was an earthly indication that Jesus Christ had presented Himself before His Father in in heaven, and He said, Father, My creatures have sinned. Father, they deserve to die. You said that they would die the day that they ate from the tree. But Father, I offer my life in place of theirs. I offer my life for for everyone that that will descend from them. I offer my life in place of theirs. And the Father says, being that you're the creator of everyone who is going to come into the world, I accept Your promise of being sacrificed so that they don't have to die. Now, is that good news? Now, I want you to notice some interesting texts from Scripture that indicate this. The sentence, by the way, was executed that day. I want that to be clearly understood. The sentence of death was executed that day, was it not? It was executed in the lambs. And what did those lambs represent? How did John the Baptist introduce Jesus? He said, Behold! The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Notice what we find in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 18 through 20. Here we find a very interesting passage which indicates that Jesus was actually sacrificed before the foundation of the world. Now you say, how could Jesus be sacrificed before the foundation of the world? He died about 2,000 years ago. Yes, He died personally 2,000 years ago, but the plan of salvation was devised in eternity. And it was implemented as soon as Adam and Eve sinned. Notice 1 Peter chapter 1 and beginning at verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But with, how were we redeemed? But with the what? With the precious blood of Christ, as of a, what? Lamb, without blemish and without spot. See, when Jesus died, He was perfect. He never sinned. That's why His sacrifice was accepted. And it says in verse 20, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. When was this plan devised? Before the foundation of the world. But then it says, continuing in verse 20, But was manifest in these last times 
for you. Foreordained in eternity. But the plan implemented in these last days for you, says Peter. Notice also Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. It's speaking about those who worship the beast. And we're not going to dwell on that at this moment. We have a whole lecture on that later on. It says here in Revelation 13 verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, now notice, slain from the foundation of the world. When was Jesus slain according to this verse? He was slain from the foundation of the world. So what happened that day when Adam and Eve sinned is that God said to Satan, I'm going to send a seed to the world. He's going to go over the same ground that Adam and Eve went over. He's going to do battle with you. He's going to live a life without sin, redeeming the failure of Adam and Eve and all of their descendants. He's going to live a perfect life. He's going to be a perfect lamb without blemish. After he gains the victory over sin, you're going to wound him. You're going to hurt him. Because he's going to die. But guess what? He's going to resurrect. And by his death and his resurrection, you who have hurt him, he is going to what? He is going to crush your head and he's going to buy back. He's going to pay the price to get back dominion and to get back the earth which Adam and Eve originally lost in which all of their descendants lost as well and all of that happened the very day that Adam and Eve sinned now how do you suppose the devil felt when he heard these words you know I can guess that the devil must have been shaking in his sandals if he wears such a thing he was scared and he made up his mind as we're going to study in this seminar that he was not going to allow that seed to come to this world he says I'm going to keep the seed from coming I'm going to do everything in my power so that that seed can't come because if the seed doesn't come then he's not going to crush my head and so from that moment on, the devil decided that he was going to prevent the seed from coming. And we're going to study that there were two methods that the devil was going to use. Let's notice the first method as it's found in Genesis chapter 4. And in a moment, I'm going to read verse 25. You remember the story of Cain and Abel? This is the first illustration in human history of Genesis 3.15. Let's take a look at that story. Do you have enmity in the story of Cain and Abel? Is there enmity? Is there war? Oh, yes. Do you have a woman in the story of Cain and Abel? Who is it? Eve. Do you have a serpent in the story of Cain and Abel? Not in Genesis. But when you go to 1 John 3 and verse 12, it says, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and killed his brother. So behind Cain was the wicked one. So the serpent is there. Do you have two seeds in the story of Cain and Abel? Do you have a seed of the woman, which represents, by the way, the righteous? And do you have a seed of the wicked one? You most certainly do. And by the way, all throughout the Old Testament, you have preliminary seeds of the woman. I want you to understand that. Uh, Abel was not the seed of the woman. He was an individual through whom God eventually would bring into the world the seed. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So there are many preliminary seeds, there are many preliminary wars before the real war takes place and before the real seed actually comes. Who wanted the death of Abel? Cain? Is that all there is to the story? Cain was the only one who wanted the death of his brother Abel? No. Satan wanted the death of Abel. Why did Satan want the death of Abel? Well, because he just hated him, right? No. What had God said to Satan? 
I'm going to send what? I'm going to send a seed to the world. And that seed is going to what? Is going to crush your head. So when Cain and Abel are born, Cain grows, and the devil says, Hmm, he's quite like me. I don't have to worry about him. But Abel, it's a different story. He offers the sacrifice of lambs. And I remember Genesis 3.21. Who knows? Maybe he's the seed. Who knows? Maybe God is planning through his descendants to bring into the world the seed. So the devil says, I'm going to nip this thing in the bud. I am going to have my seed, Cain, kill Abel. And if Abel dies... There will be no possibility of the seed coming to the world because there's only two brothers. Cain is already mine. And if Abel is dead, no seed. Do you see what the agenda is? Now you say, how do you know this? Let's go to Genesis 4 verse 25. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 25. This is after Cain kills his brother Abel. It says here in verse 25, And Adam knew his wife again. And she bore a son and named him Seth. Let's stop there for a moment. Do you know what Seth means? It means substitute in place of. Isn't that a strange name to give a son? Oh, this is my son, Substitute. This is my son in place. Why would she call him in place of? Well, she explains it. Notice once again verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again. And she bore a son and named him Seth. And then she explains. For God has appointed another seed. Any relationship to Genesis 3.15? Oh yes. Has appointed for me another seed. Instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And do you know what's interesting? In the very next chapter, you have a genealogy. Who does that genealogy begin with? It begins with Adam. It continues with Seth. And it goes all the way down to Noah. What was God doing? He was preparing a what? He was preparing a holy line. He was preparing a genealogy from where Messiah would eventually come. And then in Genesis 11, verses uh, 10 through 32, you have the list of descendants from Shem, the son of Noah, all the way to Abraham. And then in Matthew chapter 1, you have the list of descendants from Abraham all the way to the birth of Jesus. And after Jesus is born, no more genealogies. Why did God keep genealogies in the Old Testament? The sole purpose was to show that God always had a holy line from which eventually the Messiah would come into the world just as He had promised. The devil wanted to keep it from happening. But God did not allow his plans to be frustrated. In the fullness of time, the Messiah came to the world, born of a woman, did battle with Satan, lived a perfect sinless life for 33 years. And at the end of his life, being a perfect lamb without spot and without blemish, he offered his blood in place of the blood that you and I should shed so that we once again could recover dominion and we could recover the earth. For the Bible says, the meek shall inherit the earth. What a marvelous prophecy in Genesis chapter 3. You see, when man sinned, God had a solution to the problem. Now I'd like to just do a little bit of introductory work here into what we'll study a little bit later on before we bring this to a close in our lecture today. This prophecy of Genesis 3.15 is actually described in all of its glory 
in Revelation chapter 12. We're going to study Revelation 12 later on in this seminar, but you're going to find in Revelation 12 that the first scene is of a woman, we just read part of it a while ago, a woman who has a child in her womb, a seed. As, she about, as she's about to bear the seed, a dragon, who is identified as the serpent, stands next to the woman to devour her child as soon as, as he's born. But he is not successful in killing and devouring the child. Does that have any relationship to Genesis 3.15? Do you have a woman? Yes. Do you have enmity? Yes. Do you have a serpent? Yes. Do you have two seeds? Yes, because Herod acts in place of the devil to kill all of the male children. And then we're going to find later on in Revelation chapter 12 that when the child escapes from the hands of the, the serpent or the dragon, he goes after the woman. Remember that the war is also between the serpent and the woman? He goes after the woman. And later on in Revelation chapter 12, he goes against the remnant of the woman's seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We have fascinating things to study in this seminar, and I hope that we will all make it a point to be here regularly.